it's great seeing you. Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me. I'm in particularly pleased to see so many young people. This is actually uh, not so typical in, in my talks. It's usually the young people who are busy and thinks that aging is very far away, and it's the old people who thinks that it's too late. And, and maybe I'll convince you that this is uh, not the case. I also changed my title from yesterday or from Moses Leaf to 120 and talk actually about my recipe uh, for the future. And I'm going to talk specifically about some drugs that we're developing. And the main goal in developing our drugs is to uh, slow aging and allow a good quality of health a good life quality uh, without diseases as we age, not necessarily to live longer, but that's more of a side effect of a drug, to live longer, but to live healthier. So I'm going to start, and this is going to be a class. In other words, I'm going to ask you questions, and, and I don't want to speak uh, the whole time. I'd like to take questions from you. But I want to start with an abstract, and the abstract will help to connect maybe some of the things that happened yesterday. I mean, you saw yesterday two incredible, almost 90-year-old uh, people who get up and really excite uh, the audience. Uh, you saw Henry Kissinger even say, you know, I wish my parents were here. They would have loved uh, to see me uh, getting. So I, I want to make this uh, a connection. And uh, if you don't like the abstract, I suggest that you go out and, and let other people come in. But this is what I'm going to talk about. It's really a story that I heard when I was a resident here in Mount Scopus. I was a resident in internal medicine in Mount Scopus. And uh, there is the following story of a, an elderly gentleman that goes into the IGA office and asks for life insurance. And the clerk looks at him and says, we don't give life insurance to 100 years old. And he said, that's not true because my mother is insured here. And he said, just a minute, how old is your mother? And he says, my mother is 120. And is she OK? He said, yeah, she's fine. So the clerk thinks better. They go back to the boss. They come back and they say, you know what? We'll be delighted to give you life insurance. In fact, why don't you come on Tuesday and we'll have everything ready and you'll just have to sign. And the elderly gentleman says, you know, I'm sorry, I'm busy on Tuesday. And they looked at him, 100 years old, what are you doing on Tuesday? He said, it happens that on Tuesday my grandfather is getting married. <laughs> said, how old is your grandfather? He said, he's 150. And they say, he's 150 and he wants to get married? He said, he doesn't want to, but his parents put lots of pressure on him. This is the abstract of my presentation. So I'm going to uh, uh, briefly, just as far as plan, uh, there are two things I want to do. The, the really, the main thing is to talk about the future and our approach to assuring healthy aging. But I want to discuss on the way a very important question and that is if aging is a result of the environment or are there our genes. And I'm going to make a very uh, small remarks on the social economical implication of the biological or genetic research uh, that, we're do, we're, that we're doing just to, put, uh, to keep it into context. I'm not the social economical uh, academician here. I'm the biological one, but I'll just try to make uh, some kind of a connection. Okay, so here is where you come into, um, uh, into the class, and that's where I'm mastering it. I'm going to ask you, uh, do you think that aging is a result of the environment, or is it a result of the genes that we've inherited from our parents? And let me just say that I know the sophistication of the, of the audience here, and it's true that there is an interaction between genes and environment, but we're in Jerusalem, and I think that most of the people here are leaders, and I want to have a leadership decision. Do you think it's more of the environment or more of the genes? Those who think that Aging is a result of our interaction with the environment, mainly. Raise your hands and everybody look around. Environment. Okay, down. Those of you who think that our interaction 
uh, that uh, aging is mainly because of what we inherited. Raise your fingers and everybody looks around. Terrific. So there's, uh, the lights are in my eyes, but there's kind of a split here, okay? So let me tell you, if this was the board of geriatrics several years ago, the correct answer, are you ready? The correct answer would be 80% environment and 20% genes, okay? The problem is, is here, who's asking the question, okay? And the question is asked by demographers. Why demographers? They take, they have a lot of data, and they can look at the relationship between age of death and parents and their children. And they draw a line and they say, you know what, that's about 20% or 30%. It's very uh, complicated that way. And I, I don't want to go into the complexity. I will be uh, happy to answer questions. But um, I, I think the point is that philosophically, Philosophically, this is the nature, nurture questions. It comes up on, on every disease we're talking about, whether it's diabetes, it's obesity, and hypertension. Basically, we are here with our set of genes interacting with the, with the environment. And it has to start somehow at 50-50, okay? And let's say that aging is 20%. I would argue that those 20%, if we understand them, we can form a strategy to protect against the 80% of the environment. As you'll see soon, I don't think it's really 20%, at least uh, in the approach that we've been taking to this uh, subject. But let me, before I leave, uh, I, I leave the environment, let me talk about one experiment that was the experiment that I started with. Everybody started when they came to actually this very new field of aging. I was the only one uh, at Einstein in 94 that had any interest in aging. Now they're, we're big, the biggest institute in the world for biology of aging with more than 60 labs. But when we started, there was only one experiment that mattered. And I'm going to show you. This is an experiment that I didn't start, but I repeated it like everybody else. And the experiment is of caloric restriction, okay, caloric restriction. So the experiments that were done in many models, in flies and, and worms and spiders and, and pigs and dogs and mice and rats, is take brothers, okay, so let's take the genetics out. Take brothers and you let, you let half of them eat whatever they want and the other half you restrict so they get about 60% uh, of what their brothers got. And the result is that the ad libidum, that's the AL in red, the ad libidum, you know, die eventually by 130 weeks. That, that's the lifespan of rats. That's what happens. While the caloric restricted animal lives significantly longer, 30%, sometimes 40%, 50% depends on the model and the experiments. So it's, it's, a, it's just one example of not changing the genetics, changing the environment, and that's what you get. And by the way, it doesn't matter what you give them to eat. You can change in those 60%, you can change, or the 100%, you can change the lipids, you can change the proteins, the, 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 you know, the, the carbohydrates. It doesn't matter. It's really the calories that count it. Okay? So there, there's no doubt that the environment, as exemplified here by caloric restriction, has a role in aging. Okay? So I'm, I'm going to put that in the side, and I'm going to ask you a second question, which will demonstrate, you'll see very interestingly, two things. I'm going to ask you, do we, human, age at different rates? Do you know someone who's 50, and he looks more like he's 40? Do you, want, do you know somebody who's 50, and she looks more like she's 60? Uh, that's the question that uh, I'm going to ask you. So it's going to be the same thing. If you think that we humans age at different rates, please raise your fingers and everybody look around. Okay, those of you who don't think we age at different rates. So the first point is, you know, that's a master class. I just demonstrated what questions you don't ask as a professor. 
When you ask questions, you want to divide the audience. You don't want to unite them like that. But I, I just found, I, I find it so fascinating that intuitively, we all know that we age at different rates, and yet we haven't used this information to try and understand why people are, are aging slower and how we can uh, understand that and maybe adapt it and, and have it um, as, as something very important to do. Now, why would we do it? We would do it for this reason. And what I'm showing you is a slide that's taken from the National Institute of Health in America. So, you know, every government, when they get involved, the quality of the slide is not so good and you always have to improve it a little bit. So let me improve it a little bit. But what you see here is deaths according to age of many, many diseases. The one that I highlighted are cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. And there is something very common in all those diseases. The risk, the risk of death from those diseases goes from a risk of one before the age of 30 to risk of 100 or 1,000 at age of 84. So aging is the major risk for those diseases. And by the way, just that you understand, when you go into the sites of, for, in, for example, the National Heart and Blood uh, Agency in, a, in a NIH, and you look at the risk for cardiovascular disease, for heart attacks, the major risk, they say, is cholesterol. And the risk of cholesterol and heart disease is threefold. It's really amazing. It's a big risk, threefold. That's why we're all on Lipitor, okay? But aging is just, you know, this is a log scale here. Aging goes from one to uh, 200 and more with aging, almost 2,000. So aging is the, main, uh, is the main risk. So when I came to the biology of aging and I looked at that, I said, how the hell are we going to delay every age-related disease if we don't delay aging? And in fact, in the last few years, we discovered that, that we were right to, to ask this question because of the great success we had with cardiovascular disease. You know, with cardiovascular disease, we can prevent, you know, with drugs and, 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 and lifestyle. Um, with cardiovascular, when you have a heart attack, you can have a stent, you can have a bypass, you can have drugs. We did incredibly well, except that you know what happens to the people who now survive heart disease? Within two years, if they don't get another heart disease, half of them will be dead from diabetes, cancer, Alzheimer. Because all we did is we looked very specifically, technically, at one organ, and we never changed the rate of aging. And so our claim is you should try and figure out how to change the rate of aging and impact all the diseases, because otherwise, you know, I'm, I'm doing everything to prevent cardiovascular disease, and my fear is that I'm going straight to Alzheimer's, okay? And that's not an attractive thought to me. I want a, a strategy that will delay aging and therefore will delay all age-related disease, and we wouldn't switch from one disease to the other. Um, so uh, le let me uh, switch now to the future and by the way, that, that maybe also explains to you why I'm going to talk about the 100 years old. Because we believe that as a group, their aging has been slowed. And they are extreme, but that's the group we want to we do. And uh, the, 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 the background, there's just a few background remarks. Uh, to be 100, you know, only one of 10,000 is 100 years old probably a little more uh, in Israel, or, or a little one to 5,000. And there are more 100 years old that are coming into, um, in, in, into, being, uh, into, into being a lifestyle because they are more bionic. You know, they have pacemakers and they have hip replacements and they have eyes and ears and, uh, and other things. So there, there are more of them now. And we're actually looking at those who got there so we are looking at those who are healthy at 95. To come in my study, you have to be healthy at 95, living independently. 
So we are trying to look at the best of the best. And we've collected so far over 550 people who are very healthy at this age. And as we and other across the world, unfortunately not enough groups, but as other across the world have looked um, at those centenarians, centenarians are 100 years old, uh, there is a remarkable family history of longevity in their family. And in fact, I'm going to claim that in those centenarians, the genetics is more like 80% versus the environment is 20%. I think they are switching that. But it was very reassuring not to have only very rare individuals. You know, when, when you think about genetics, you think about a disease like cystic fibrosis. There's only one gene, one mutation in one gene that causes cystic fibrosis. And it's much more common than to be 100 years old. So we take something genetically very rare and that there's a family history. So, you know, you think that this is a good uh, population to deal with. Now, we formed two hypotheses as we took those uh, centenarians. One hypothesis is, number one here, is that they have the perfect genome. In other words, we know that our genomes have a lot of mutation, polymorphism, SNPs, ne never mind those last three things, I'm not going into that, but I'm saying the same thing, which is change in the sequence of DNA or important changes in the sequence of DNA. So maybe there are, there are lots of genes that are associated with diseases, with cardiovascular disease, with Alzheimer, with diabetes. Maybe they have the perfect genome. It's just they don't have any one of those other genes that are common in the population. And let me tell you already that we know that it's not true. And we are four different studies that confirm that centenarians have just as much of disease gene as the rest of the population. And that brings us to the second hypothesis that maybe centenarians have protective genes. They have something that protects them in a way that they can deal with some aging genes. It, it depends on the biological interaction. It could be upstream or downstream, but they can handle that. And this is the hypothesis that seems to be winning, and that's where we also uh, contributed to. So let me uh, give you just first this example. You see four people here in the picture, and it's an old picture, but we'll improve it in a second. And those four, uh, two girls, two boys, were born between 1910 and 1920 to two people in New York City. Each one of them passed 102. Now, this woman died last November, uh, one month shy of 110. Uh, her uh, brother here is 107 years old, and I'm going to show you a clip of a movie from him. This brother is 105 years old, and this little sister died at 102. They were shocked. They <laughs> just couldn't believe that, that she died. I want to show you a clip, and I'm taking uh, just two minutes out of it, or maybe a little uh, longer, in order for you really to understand that if somebody is healthy at 107, he's 107 now, the clip was when he's 105, but he's doing the same things exactly. If somebody is healthy at 107, they can have really good life. In other words, I want in your mind to dissociate between aging and the diseases and the quality of life and healthy aging. And that's why I'm showing you uh, this clip. So can, can we start? He's born himself. Show me the paper. <laughs> Thomas believes his father's thirst. Tom is the, is the son. Work is his life. So he's always been a absorber of information. Ever since I was a child, he would bring home annual reports and read them at the dinner table. He was, and that's what he still does. He's in the Aztec website. And Irving says not working is unthinkable. Oh, I would pay you and send it away from me yet to try to buy it back. He believes mental challenge is key. The important thing is to keep that brain going, you see. 50.2 million, increased on the 8%. To stay sharp, 
Irving reads materials online, two financial newspapers daily, and a wide range of nonfiction. I read a lot of science. I read no fiction, no mystery stories, and no sex novels. Dr. Ruth, where are you? <laughs> Said I have a lot of time. And it was Irving's interest in science that led him to participate in the Longevity Genes Project at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, led by researcher Nir Barzilai. Nir and his team have... She's volunteering in my lab. She's 100 years old. 95 to 112, and their children. Irving and Thomas are part of the study, as is Irving's big sister. Okay, his sister dropped by. 108-year-old Helen Reichert, a former television host and fashion historian who recently had a stroke but is otherwise in excellent health. So far, Nir and his team have found several gene variants that are more common in this group and protect against cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and Alzheimer's. Erwin uh, has the CTP genotype that seems to be protective against several age-related diseases, including uh, cognitive decline. Nir's team has also found that some genes seem to protect against the effects of certain lifestyle habits. Irving, for instance, used to smoke, but quit to set an example for his children. And Helen smoked for more than 80 years. You can see both from him and his sister that those genes have real amazing effect, not only on the fact that they're alive, but considering the fact that they were smoking and this should have shortened their lifespan. Mess. Thank you. And Irving believes Thank long you. life has its own. Uh, Irwin is a... Uh, uh, Erwin is, uh, can, can you go back to the slides? Erwin is uh, uh, still helping to manage a hedge fund with $700 million uh, in New York City, and that's where you can find him when you want to get an interview. So, but, but they raised a very important question because I, I kind of, I, I, I brought the environment in. I tried to say that it's not important, maybe to those people. So let, let me just focus a little bit on the, on the environment here. So uh, we looked at major risks of the environment to see if maybe the centenarians, all, all that they did was really paid attention to what the doctor said. You know, don't smoke, don't be overweight or obese, exercise, etc. cetera. And, and those are the results. Overweight or obesity are 48% in men, 44% in uh, women, uh, smoking 60% in men, 30% in women. Alcohol daily, alcohol is good. You have to drink, women have to drink one glass of wine, men maybe two glasses of wine. They don't do much of that. Physical activity, and we're talking here, walking, bicycling, housework, just mild, you know, less than half are doing that. If you're interested in vegetarians, only 2%. And by the way, we have control groups for their time, for when they were like that, and, um, and they were doing either worse or, or, or the same. So the point here is they, as a population, haven't done what we tell our patients to do, and they haven't been calorically restricted or, or something like that. Let me just uh, make a provocation here. I'll tell you how Jay Leno from The Tonight Show have summarized this study. Can you please do the next? By a study at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I know where that is, but that, that's what it says. They say the secret to a long life may actually be more drinking, partying, and less exercise. <laughs> The good thing about this combination is, even if you don't live longer, you don't care. <laughs> Thank you. And, and that's, my, uh, that, that's my fear, really. Uh, this is a picture of them 90 years before. One of the genes that we discovered, uh, they decided to do the cover. And so you see them 90 years later. And when he received his gun, she got the permission to start smoking. And she actually smoked for 90 years, more than 90 years, two packs of, of cigarettes, 90 years. So what I, what I really, my, my fear is, I don't want anybody to go out and say, we don't have to do the thing uh, to interact with the environment. Here, there are all those 100 years old that didn't do that. But they can allow themselves not to do it. The rest of us, when we don't have longevity genes in our family, I cannot allow, uh, allow us to do it. So 
so there, there are really two things. First of all, if, if, you, if you smoke for 90 years, you're going to live long life. Okay, but, but, but really the point is that's their interactions with the environment. They are protective and it's not for the rest of us. Okay. Now, I, I just um, showed you several, um, you know, I showed you that I have a bunch of centenarians, but, you know, we're scientists. We need a control group. Who are we comparing them to? Their friends died 50 years ago. And what we've done in our study that is unique, we took their offspring. In fact, we don't really, we don't really collect centenarians without their offspring because their offspring are enriched with the longevity genotype and phenotype. And for the offspring, we have a control. Oops, I didn't mean that. We have a control. We have a control group. Uh, that's not that either. A control group that, um, that is gender and match. Oh, sorry, I did it again. I'll learn. I'll learn. OK. And, and the third point that I want to make, uh, and th that's bringing the Jewish point here to this uh, conference, when you do genetic discoveries, it's always good to deal with homogeneous population. The best homogeneous population in the world is the, the Icelandic. There, there are half a million people who are all children of five Vikings and four Irish women. You know, they're they are like brothers, cousins, okay? So there's a lot of, of things to do here. But we, because of our history, which everybody knows in, in this audience, we are actually relatively homogeneous. And for genetic reasons, this is a really great population to deal with. And not only that, we are homogeneous in the United States, also in the, in the socioeconomically uh, way, so which, which really takes care of a lot of the uh, environmental factor. And just to show you that we're kind of doing okay in, in how we looked at the study, this compares the offspring and control for several age-related diseases, and the offspring have less hypertension, less diabetes, less myocardial infarction, and less stroke. But I'll bring now the centenarians. The centenarians are 100 are 30 years older than their control group, and they barely have the same hypertension, much less diabetes, and the same prevalence of myocardial infarction and stroke. So you see that the offspring are healthier, but the centenarians, from an age-related disease perspective, their aging has been delayed by about 20, 30 years. And th this is the population we are studying. I see that the time is uh, running here. I'm going to skip that. And I just want to briefly tell you that we are interrogating uh, the genome. And uh, this is just a scheme of a cell and the nucleus and the chromosome. And you take one of the chromosome and you start pulling uh, one of its uh, edges. And you're going even eventually to get the double helix uh, uh, DNA. But it's really the sequence here where we're, we are trying to look for what I told you, mutations or variants or SNPs. But it's not that simple because there are other uh, things that are called epigenetics. It's not a subject I'm going into now, but the epigenetics and genetics are really crucial in order to understand the, the genome of, of those 100 years old. And I'll just show you a graph that shows how some of our longevity genes are overrepresented in centenarians. You see. This longevity gene is about 8% at age 64, but in centenarians, it's 17%. So they're overrepresented in centenarians. And those studies have been published. I'll just tell you two little stories. And one of them is this one that is only in 2% of our centenarians. But this is an interesting story because it comes from nature. And in nature, the dwarf models live longer. The ponies live longer than the horse. The small dogs live longer than the large dogs. When you mutate or have spontaneous uh, dwarfism in rats and mice, they all live longer. It's really interesting. So we find those 2% of Jewish women who have been short all their life, not dwarf, but short all their life, and they have actually a functional problem, a mutation with functional problem in this growth hormone axis. So, uh, so this is kind of, it's not the reason why most centenarians get to this age, but it's consistent to what we study in nature. The second one is actually the red one here that goes from about 8% to 
to 20%. And this is interesting because this is a subject for drug development. And let me just make another point clear. When we are looking at those genotypes that are overrepresented at 100 years old, we are thinking of them as delaying aging, okay? And uh, so they should be effective not against one disease, one disease, but against more. Now, it happens that this CTP genotype is involved in the good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, which is very high in families of centenarians. And one of the things that we show that this good cholesterol is not only effective in preventing heart disease in those people, but actually they're effective in preventing cognitive function. And we took our study to a population that's not Jewish and we repeated it. And you see here in red, those who have the good mutations versus those in black that don't have the good mutations or those that are heterozygous, they have one copy. And you see that dementia and Alzheimer were prevented by about 70%. In other words, this kind of genotype has not been effective only one disease, but several. And that's why we look at it as a true longevity gene or a true anti-aging uh, gene. And as I told you, this is uh, actually Merck and Roche, and Merck is our conviction, and we push them to do that. And they have been, uh, th there is a drug in phase three trial now that will be, ended, uh, will be ending at 2013. The end point is cardiovascular disease, but we're pushing Merck to already do the cognitive function because we want to see if you imitate what happens in centenarians, if you develop this drug, will it prevent cardiovascular disease, maybe diabetes, maybe Alzheimer? And that's, that's our goal. So let me end by just a short statement about the cost here. And you understand that if we're going to tackle aging and if people are going to be healthier uh, for longer or live longer, there is a cost, and the cost has to be considered in many levels. Age of retirement, pensions, and uh, you know all those other things that we are uh, discussing. So I want to talk about the cost only as far as medical, medical cost. And there's a very important information that's emerging out of our research. And that is that if somebody dies at age 80, they're typically sick at the last three to five years of their life. They had they had a, you know, a bypass, they have diabetes, they have something else. When we look at our centenarians, they're sick only in the last eight months of their life. So not only did they live healthier longer, but even in an absolute, not only in a relative sense, in an absolute sense, they've been sick for much a shorter period of time. It's called the contraction of morbidity. It's a very important uh, aspect, both clinically and economically. And that's what we are trying to do. And there is support. In fact, Gadi Rennert from the Technion has also written about that uh, in Israel, or showed it in Israel. But there is support to the fact that the medical cost in the two last year of life, so somebody who's dying between 60 and 7, to those who are dying at 100, the medical cost is third of those that died over the age of 100. And remember, those who are 100 years old, they even didn't go to a medical checkup when they were 60 or 70. So the point is, if we can increase the healthy lifespan, the medical cost, medical cost will be lower. There are other considerations, but will be lower. So let me uh, summarize, first of all, the title of the talk is Why Moses Lived to Be uh, 120. Somebody wants to give other numbers for uh, our fathers and uh, biblical? Right? Nine, nine, well, nobody said the real age. Nine, 969, right? Any, anybody else? Well, th those are the numbers. And... Uh, uh, you, you know, by the way, it's really amazing, and, and I wrote of the, uh, about it in Haaretz, uh, in, a, in a Rosh Hashanah section. When you ask Orthodox people about the Bible, they believe in every word, right, in the Bible. It's the Divrei Moshe. Uh, when I say, but what about the ages? They said, ah, you know, we, we, we don't buy it. It's really interesting. But, but 
I would say I would make two points that are related to our uh, to to my to my lecture here, and that is uh, you can see interaction of uh, of the environment and genes because it looks like the genes have drowned in the flood because then lifespan has become uh, really shorter. I, I would also make the point that Joseph didn't live long. And this goes back to Egypt, I think, to be a deputy of Pharaoh or Mubarak or anybody else is a really big stress to the environment. I would say one thing about Moses. I think, I, I don't know how long he really lived, obviously, but um, exercise, and he seems to be walking quite a lot for many years, <laughs> and caloric restriction were probably important in his, uh, in his longevity. So I hope that I show you that if you prevent aging, you can prevent, you will prevent age-related diseases. I hope that I showed you that the research to the biology and genetic of aging is bearing fruit. And I showed you only one example, but uh, with another Israeli colleague, we have a biotech that is actually working on a, on a thing that might be even more promising, and others are working too, based on our uh, findings. And also, to keep in mind that healthy aging is not necessarily going to destroy us. This is a complex story, but from a medical cost, it's worth to be healthy uh, all the time. So I want to make sure that you understand that the goals of our study is to prevent the chronic debilitating age-related diseases and not to live longer. Living longer is a side effect and we'll apologize when we give the drugs. I also want to tell you that there is a lot of people involved in this study uh, some of the people in red are uh, from Israel. And I want to show you Frida, who is my wife's grandmother, at her 100th birthday. By the way, she died at 102. She was sick only in the last two weeks of her life. And here she's drinking uh, wine pretty much from the bottle. At that, at, that time, at that time, she was still dating. But she, on principle, she was dating only people who could drive. Okay, and that meant that the, the, the oldest she could find was less than 85 years old, and that became a little weird for her. But, you know, when you understand that those people are good example, I think that uh, we are in the process of uh, getting to the future, making those backgrounds, and making sure that everybody uh, is healthy as they age. Thanks for listening.